Welcome back to episode 6 of Anime Kiwi, season 3. We're talking about episodes 23 through 26 of Monster today. I'm Mike. Uh, with me as always, I have this guy. Who? You. Me. You. Me. That guy. Who, who, who am I? I don't know. Who are you? Introduce yourself. Who am I? I'm, I'm Katoda, apparently. He suffered a blow to the head in the last week and he's still kind of iffy about who he is. Might as well have been. I haven't been sleeping very well lately. Well, that's not good. I couldn't figure out a joke to put in there. Yeah, it's not a very joke-worthy thing. Oh, I'm tired all the time. Uh... Anyways, what do you think of these four apps? I'm having trouble with the specifics of each episode, remembering them. Um, I didn't hate them, so... That's probably because of the sleep. Yeah, probably that. But I, I don't remember hating them. Uh... Though I do remember this is starting to bring in more stuff about Johan in places, so that was cool. Yeah, this is the most we've seen of him. Yeah, they're showing him actually interacting with people and, and showing you that, you know, contrary to some depictions of this sort of killer, you know, he's very charismatic and people like him and stuff. Yeah. But there's always that element to him that seems really off and some people don't pick up on it, you know. Mm-hmm. He's an unsettling boy. Yeah, un like likable but unsettling, which is how I'd describe anybody that falls into the category of uh, sociopath or psychopath. Yeah, it's almost a, a Manson-like thing he's got. Yeah, definitely. Uh, kind of, uh, you know, with his circle of followers, it kind of comes back to similar things with Manson sort of followers and whatnot. Crazy people out there being attracted to crazy people. Well, that's not for a few apps. Uh, first off, we have an episode where Eva takes the spotlight. Um, we see her in jail for public drunkenness, and she's being uh, very rude to the guards in the jail, but they let her out, uh, and she seems to not be in the best state that she could be. Uh, and they kind of show this by her picking up a half-smoked cigarette from the ground and just lighting that up. But I was kind of surprised that she was in jail for public drunkenness and not burning her house down. That seemed kind of weird to me. Maybe she could just pass that off as, you know, an accident. I guess. A fire gone out of control. I guess. Uh, but after she burned her house down, she seems to be out of money. Because uh, in addition to smoking the used cigarette, she goes and steals a thing of whiskey from a hobo and drinks it in front of him. And then she gets home. Uh, I think at some point in here, she was looking for a bag she had at the club that she was arrested at, and she can't find it. Um, but she gets home, and the whole place is ransacked. And the landlord here, I think, was also pestering her about paying rent because she's behind or something. Uh, but anyway, she's out, out in public again, and a man walks up and has the bag she lost. And the camera pans up, and it is our friend Roberto from the last episode? I oh, know, he's in there somewhere. Yeah. No, but he's, he's not a good, he's a bad, bad man. Yeah, I, I would, I would have a fist fight with that man. He's, he's, he's a bad boy. He's a very bad boy. Uh, but so he takes Eva to, I can't, I don't remember if it's his hotel room or her apartment or something. Uh, but it's been a while since we've seen Ava, so they kind of recap the relationships that she's had with people by a photo album that she keeps in her bag, which they tie into the plot by there being a bunch of missing photos, which supposedly show Johan. And Roberto wants those, because I guess he's one of the people Johan has in charge of uh, erasing his past. That's what it seems like, right? Uh, yeah, uh, it, his allegiance is a bit foggy. It doesn't, like, it seems like he's, you know, one of Johan's followers, but he's doing stuff that doesn't necessarily fall into what you would think would be Johan's wishes, especially with, like, honor and stuff. Yeah. Uh, but, so Roberto really wants those pictures. In addition to this, 
Eva drops a bomb on him that she was actually there the night that Junkers was killed, and she saw Johan and basically witnessed all that stuff happening. So she's trying to trade her life basically with Roberto, but Roberto also knows where Tenma is, supposedly, and is trying to use that as a bargaining chip to get the information or the pictures he has from Eva, and eventually kill her, I guess. At this point, we get a flashback to that night where Junkers died, and she's talking to someone, who I'm not sure who that was, but he seems to know, like, what Tenma's gonna be doing for, like, dates and stuff, and tipping her off. And she goes and ruins those dates. Um, and we also see her walking, and it's we see that nutcracker clock in the window that Tenma bought for Junkers that night. So that kind of establishes when this is. Wasn't the um that guy that was tipping her off? Wasn't that one of the other doctors, one of the surgeons? Oh, was it? Uh, yeah, I think I think his name starts with a B or something. I'm bad with names. Go back in my notes real quick and see if I have it written down. I feel like I might not though. I don't. Oh well. It's not important. Um, but anyway, so uh, the story happens and somewhere in there, Roberto slaps her around a bunch I guess, for not doing what he wants. And then they sleep together and then the episode ends with him pulling a gun on her while she's still in bed. All this stuff's kind of a little bit, the timeline's a little bit fuzzy in my head, but that's more or less how that happens, right? Uh, yeah, from what I remember. It is certainly kind of a strange ending. Yeah. But then the next episode uh, goes, continues right from that point. Uh, they talk more about that night, and uh, they kind of form a deal where she'll give him the pictures if she finds out where Tenma is uh, for what he thinks is to kill Tenma. Meanwhile, Tenma is working for, I think they said it was the second in charge of the syndicate, which I guess we're led to presume is the syndicate that the ex-detective from a couple episodes ago, the one where he met Roberto, was working for. Um, and he had a head wound that uh, Tenma, Tenma treated. Um, we also find out that the, the thief guy from when the baby was going to set fire to the Turkish quarter is with them. And shit, if I can't remember his name. Uh, Which I was thinking, like, why the hell is he with them? Like... Didn't he do some pretty messed up shit during that whole episode? I don't think he... He was... I don't think he did. What do you do? He tried... He stole a rug from a person. That was about it, right? And then he... I, gu I guess he did sort of... Uh, he sort of bucked up in the end, from what I remember. Like, he was gonna leave them to die, basically, but he ended up... Not. Like, helping. Yeah. But he's with them, um, and the crime lord guy starts talking about a money laundering operation, um, where it got bigger and bigger, but then the head of the operation died, and everybody else was fighting to take control, and it is uh, slowly revealed that. Um, it was a young kid that started it, and we're led to believe that it's Johan that started this operation and built it up and up, and then it's unclear if he killed the guy who was in charge or what, but it's, it's definitely his M.O. to build the thing up, to watch it devolve and crumble. Uh, but this Crime Lord guy seems kind of like a, a pretty big crossroads between 
how Tenma does stuff and how Johan does stuff, because he's experienced how Johan does things. But we see Tenma change him, as we've seen it happen so many other times in the show, where Tenma's talking about how his wound is getting better, and it's a nice day out, so they should eat lunch outside. And the guy was, the crime lord was wondering, why would we do that? And he kind of realized that it's been a long time since he sit and ate at a table with people and had it be kind of a nice thing. So it's kind of Tenma warming his heart over, I guess, is a cliche way to put it. After he's experienced the way, the way Johan does stuff, right? Uh, yeah. Um, I don't know who, if you were asking me. Yeah. It was okay well um i don't know if it's necessarily because of his experience the way that johan did everything but it's just an organization like that a crime organization it doesn't really lend itself to having nice family dinners or anything like that yeah i guess unless you've what oh i mean they do in like the godfather and stuff but that's maybe not the same kind of thing at all yeah i, I wouldn't call those dinners nice anyway some of them were the, the wedding at the beginning was nice. Yeah, kind of. Until the whole horse on the bed thing. That was not during the wedding. That was in the middle of well, the that, movie. Well, that was immediately after, I think. That's... Though it's been a while since I've seen The Godfather. Uh, there was the wedding, and then they had the singer guy, and he wanted out of his contract, and the the guy in California wouldn't let him out, and they sent the guy over, and then the horse head. It was pretty close after but i should watch the movie again. it's been a while yeah i haven't seen it in maybe 10 years or something it's been it's quite a while it's a good movie second one's good too yeah i've never seen the third but apparently it's hilarious i've also never seen the third maybe that's another podcast right there we'll see maybe uh, but anyway uh roberto is at this house in the woods that tenma and the Crime Lord and Dieter and Bratman are at, and however many bodyguards are at, around. And he brought Eva with him. At this point, Dieter has been sent to go get one of the bodyguards, who the Crime Lord says is his last friend. Uh, but before Dieter can get there, Roberto kills the guy. Um, at which point the Crime Lord... Kind of, I forget how he knows. I, was it just the gunshot or what that he knows that the guy is dead? Uh, he had like a dead man switch. Oh, yeah, dead man switch. Okay. Uh, but anyways, so basically, uh, Dieter gets there to see Ava, and she tells him to run. Eva basically betrays, kind of betrays, uh, Roberto, and she gets shot in the leg for it. And she goes on about how Dieter should just leave her, and Dieter doesn't want to. And she says, do it, because Tenma's not going to come to save me. Why would he come to save me? And then Tenma comes and saves her, basically. Um, and then we learn that... Was it, this, it was this episode, I think, we learned that Roberto wasn't there. He just bounced, basically, after he shot Ava. Because he realized that it wasn't going to be uh, an easy in and out. Yeah, like his, his plan, uh, it depended entirely on Ava actually doing what he wanted. And when she betrayed him, then he's like, yeah, this plan is going to work and just left. Mm -hmm. Not much for uh, thinking on the fly, that Roberto. No, not really. But anyways, uh, Tenma treats Ava's wound. She's alive. And she is... Uh, as of the end of the episode, eating lunch outside with the Crime Lord guy, who's now kind of emulating Tenma's kind of way of being, I guess. And he's having lunch with her outside and trying to, I guess, preach the way of Tenma, kind of. Maybe not, that's maybe strong for what he's doing, but that's kind of what it feels like it's going for. And that's the end of the episode. You sleeping? Uh, kind of. Oh, that's maybe not great. 
I know. I'm going in and out. <laughs> well, we got two more episodes, but I can make it. You can make it. Well, yeah. I have good news for you. We have something to wake you up. We have another episode of our world famous game, Anime Fake Out. You sure it's going to wake me up? You sure it's not going to make me go for the big sleep? Uh, it might make you want to die. Ah, this one's not that bad. It might be hard. You might have to think a little bit. They're all bad. It's anime. It's all bad. You like this one? You like Kids on the Slope? That's two out There's of three. There's no proof of that. There's no proof of that. There's like four hours of proof of that. Circumstantial evidence. Three hours of proof? Four hours? It's there. Anyway, anime fake out. First up. We have a show called Dash Back. Kunio Koizumi is an aging rock star on the way out. One day, he sees a young girl, Yui, performing on a street corner. He has an epiphany and is determined to collaborate with her. Will they team up? Could Yui be Kunio's ticket back into the spotlight? And next we have Beck, Mongolian Chop Squad. Yuiko Tanaka Better known by his nickname, Koyuki, is a 14-year-old who feels disconnected from life in general. Through the act of saving a mismatched dog, he meets guitarist Ryusuke Minami and becomes involved in Ryusuke's new band, Beck. Koyuki's life starts to change as the band struggles towards fame. That second one isn't... Is that, is that a bit? Are you doing a bit with the second one? What? He's joining a band called Beck? I mean, which one's which one's real? He's join. I mean, that's that. That's what I read, isn't it? He's joining a band called Beck. Ryusuke's new band, Beck. But like, if if that anime was real, then that would mean that there is an anime out there where there's an anime band named Beck, and that's a joke, right? Is it a joke? That's kind of what the game is here, my dude. I don't know, like. <laughs> Even you just picking that one, even if that's a fake one, that's kind of a genius move, because now you've got me confused about this fake band named Beck when a real band called Beck already exists. So I'm just confused. Maybe it's an adaptation. That would be a weird adaptation. It's a biopic. I'm gonna guess the second one is fake, just because of the Beck thing. Uh, the Beck one is real. Why is it, why is it called Beck? Let's see here. Uh, Beck, Mongolian Chop Squad. What the hell does Mongolian Chop Squad mean? I don't know. Band names don't have to make sense. Uh, it also got a live-action film adaptation. So there was a physical band for a movie called Beck. Uh-huh. This is just really strange. It also spawned four soundtracks, a video game, and a line of guitars. So you could buy a guitar in Japan that says Beck on it. That's not confusing at all. Apparently he's very well received and won some awards. Who knows, maybe it's our next thing. We should let Beck know. I mean, it's been around since... When? When was the comic? 1999. I hope he knows by now. <laughs> I'm sure he's familiar with it. He's had almost two, 20 years to find out. So keep an eye out. Maybe it's a plan by, um... Maybe it's a plan by Xenu to discredit him. Is Beck the, socio the Scientologist? I forget. Let's see. He is an active Scientologist. Yeah. Yeah, that, that makes sense. It's the Thetans out there trying to trick everybody. But look out for upcoming anime Kiwi in which we watch the anime back, maybe. Yeah, know. that's that, That's coming very soon. Definitely. Yeah, that's music. Maybe you'd like it. When they have an episode of, of uh, where Beck appears in the band, and they're just like, who are you? A real Simpsons cameo. And then we'll, we'll let's play the video game. I'm sure it's terrible. I bet it's a rhythm game. Well, it's probably just another one of those Hatsune Miku sort of press the button or at the right time. Well, except it's uh, PS2, so it's probably more like a Parappa. Let's see if I can find anything for that real quick. Um, it is indeed a rhythm game. And a string of notes. Yeah, it's kind of like a Parappa, it looks like. So, that's Beck, the real one. You're one for four. Daughter. I'm I'm very proud to be bad at this. I mean you did get that one. It's a mark of shame on my character that will follow me for the rest of my days. Yeah, anyway, on to the next episode, The Thursday Boy, where we meet some new characters. No Tenma at all here. No we've until the very end, no new characters or no old characters at all. Well thank God. 
we meet well, that, that Tenma also. Fuck that guy. We meet uh Carl Carl Neumann. Carl Newman. I don't remember how they say it in this. I think it should be Neumann. I'm just gonna call him Carl. Um he's reading books to an old man. And the old man says that he's doing a bad job pronouncing Latin things and tells him to get out. At this point, uh, we meet a girl named Lot, who is, also works for the old man cleaning up the house, and we learn some stuff about him that he has, uh, I guess, a legend behind him, I guess? Uh, urban myth, where they're calling him the the vampire of Bayern, where he goes into town at two in the morning uh, into what looks like a red light district and kind of disappears into the alleys. We also learn that Carl is just one of numerous boys who reads to the old man, whose name I should have said is Hans Schubert, and Carl is the boy. He's the Tuesday boy? I think he's the Tuesday boy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. But then we learn a little bit more about Carl. He came to the university he's at, which is Munich University, I think. Because uh, he's looking for... Were you going to say something? Uh, well, You said Munich, and it, and it stuck in my craw a bit. Munich? Munich. Munich? Munich, you motherfucker. I see H, itch. It's Munich. That's how you pronounce it. I mean, if you want to be technical, might as well just say München. What? That's what the town is called in German. Okay. So anyway, they're at Munich University, um, and Carl's looking you for You motherfucker, <laughs> I'm gonna... I'm... <laughs> You're just gonna do this to annoy me now, aren't you? And Carl's looking for his mom. Um, uh, he... His dad... Uh, basically deserted them when he was a kid and his mom seems to be in trouble. Uh, so she puts him on a train and tells him to go live with I forget who. Do you remember who? So do I. I forgot to. But anyways, he goes and lives somewhere else for a while and he comes back to Munich to look for his mom. I'm ignoring you. And then at some point in here we hear a prophecy about the Thursday boy, how he'll, like, light the city on fire or something and cause chaos. And it, at this point, the immediate gut reaction is like, oh, the Thursday boy is Johan, right? Because I think at this point they also talk about uh, the Thurs somewhere. Oh, no, that's a little farther on. Uh, the, after this next part where Carl goes to it looks like a uh, back door for a brothel or something, and he meets someone who is saying that she has the name of his mom, which is Margot Langer. Uh, and Carl's like, no, no, you're not my mom. Uh, she says that he's, Carl is not the only boy that came in, that there was a quiet blonde boy that also came in that reads for Mr. Schubert. Um, and at this point we are left to conclude that Johan must be the Thursday boy, which also makes it seem, and the, the story is that we kind of learn, I think it's at this point that, uh, Schubert is Carl's father, that he had a kid with Margot Langer, and he's going back to her place to kind of try and make amends for ditching them. And so there's been more than one boy over the years who's gone in and claimed to be his son. Um, and the Thursday boy happens to be one of those boys that's doing that. So it seems, at this point, like we just learned maybe something about Johan's past, kind of. It's still kind of uncertain if this is something we're to believe or not. but. At this point, uh, we they're back on campus, and there's a hubbub, uh, and it seems one of the students has 
killed themselves in their room. And we learn that it is one Edmund Farren, and he is the Thursday boy. And I don't remember why, but Carl has like a real a stink face on, like he's smelled something unpleasant. Um, that I, as I watch the next episode, I realize that he, that's just kind of his face all the time. Like there's a piece of stinky cheese taped under his nose or something. Yeah, he does have a bit of like resting bitch face going on, but I mean, there's a, there's a know, difference between that and a stink face. I don't know it's kind of the same thing yeah. in my mind, but yeah, kind you of. know, there's that whole thing that when people die, they fucking shit themselves. So maybe he was smell on that. Maybe, but anyways, uh, we see a boy come up to him at the end and introduce himself as Johan, and he says that he is the Friday boy. And that episode ends. Something I think is really surprising and kind of... It's very subtle, but it indicates a lot about Johan's character is that he just straight up says his full name to them without worrying mm -hmm. about anything that, you know... He didn't worry about a single repercussion of that. He just says his name out loud. Well, he um, erases past, so if something goes bad, he can just erase these two. Exactly, but at the same time, it's still kind of brazen because there are people that know who he is out there. And he doesn't know whether or not that name's going to get out there and get back to him or, or not. Uh, like, how quickly it will be, at least. Well, he just, he doesn't care. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's very brazen, but I guess it doesn't quite tie up until the end of the next episode, but I was very pleasantly surprised about how, uh, like, how it's revealed what everything that's going on happens. Uh, how it all lined up because I was very confused about the kind of what exactly went on until they started dropping like hints and pieces in the next episode. It's it's extremely well done. Well, how about you? You talk about this episode some since you liked it so much. You mean do the plot synopsis? Yeah, we're down to one. You can eliminate stuff that's not in this episode out of your mind. You should be able to do it. I believe in you. I, I don't think I can. I'm, I'm really terrible at remem remembering plot details. Like, I don't have any notes or anything. You should probably start taking notes. Probably should. <sighs> I guess I'll do it. Uh, I'll do it next time, I promise. Next time. 27 through 30 is Dota, okay. Dota's summary hour. Uh, so we're at a... There's a... The detective on the case is investigating Edmund's suicide, and he is with a doctor, just talking about whatever he's up to. And he shows the doctor a picture of Edmund. I guess the doctor's a psychologist, right? Not a... Not a hands-dirty doctor. Yeah, some, some kind of psychologist or, I don't know criminal psychologist or something yeah so the the psychologist basically says stuff that matched up to what we know of edmund but at the end says that this isn't a guy who would kill himself over a plan going wrong which gets the investigator a little bit more suspicious than he was uh at this point we learn that this detective is kind of a fuck up. Uh, that they were on a case bringing someone in, and he had a little bit too much to drink, is what I recall, and shot the guy that they were trying to bring in. So he's kind of uh, being put on like easy cases or cases that aren't of any concern, just to get him out of the way. Uh, but he is looking around Edmund's apartment and is looking through his books and there's books on it's mostly books on philosophy but then he gets to one on a war of some sort and opens it up and flips through and it's all in latin but there is one sentence underlined and so he gets over he goes to the the boy next door basically and after uh, the the guy next door is very reluctant to help, but uh, 
he roughly translates Paston's book for him, and the inspector realized that this is what Edmund wrote in his notebook wasn't a suicide note, but he was translating this packet, or this passage. So he's pretty certain right now that this was a murder and not a suicide. Meanwhile, we flash over to Johan with Carl and Lot, and they're on a rooftop, and Johan is just kind of walking on the very edge of the roof, and uh, they mention how that's dangerous and how he maybe shouldn't do that, but Johan is kind of playing to their sympathies in other ways, talking about how he's an orphan, and this is like our first look at how Johan gets his hooks into people, I think, right? Uh, yeah, I, I'd agree with that. He's um, he's not just trying to get their sympathies, but he's trying to make it appear that he's empathizing strongly with them as well. So it's yeah. reciprocal. Mm -hmm. Trying to make them buds who'll do whatever he wants for them. Yeah, he's trying to bond with them. It's But, you know, obviously in a very cynical way because we know who he is and everything. Mm -hmm. uh, but this point... Uh, they come up with a plan where they're going to talk to uh, Schubert. And so they kind of heist Schubert out of his house and lock his bodyguard in the bathroom while they do it. And they take him to uh, what he thought would be a forest that he always liked going to. And it ends up being a construction site. The forest is gone. And uh, Carl and Lot are trying to lie to him and say, oh no, it's a forest. Can't, don't you feel the trees or something? I don't remember exactly what it was. It wasn't that, uh, that Johan started doing that. He's the one that sort of initiated the pretending it's well, that forest. I, th I think they did, but they weren't sure how to do it. And then Johan came rolling up. He's like, no, it's not a construction site. It's a forest. And then he like picks something off the ground and like transmutes it into an apple and gives it to Schub Schubert. Yeah, I think it's just implied that he's just pretending that it's an apple and it's kind of, I don't know, a shared moment of mass hysteria. Oh, okay. Because Schubert is blind. This has been determined. He's, he can't see. This is in the last episode. I didn't mention that. My bad. Oh, we should have mentioned that. I probably should have. It's probably important. But anyways, um, I think that's the end of this, right? The whole apple thing? Uh, yeah, I think so. I can't remember anything else, at least. And yeah, the, them bringing the forest was uh, their way of trying to help Carl reconcile with Schu Schubert, who he thinks is his father. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure where that's going. I'm not either, but we'll see. These three characters have... It's a third big plot line, it looks like, going on here. So we'll see what's going on. Maybe the next episode will start with just... The corpse is on the floor and Johan just standing there or something? Yep, and make us very wrong. That's not a huge new plot line going on. Maybe. But that's for next week. So what do you think what do you think of these four? I th I think the last episode is probably the strongest, just because of how they tie up that uh, whole mystery with the kid who supposedly killed himself. Mm-hmm. Because, like, the entire time up until they revealed how that happened, I thought that Johan being responsible kind of didn't make sense. Until they started lining up things, like you... You're hearing that uh, Johan was actually with him when he was speaking to that uh, ex-prostitute and how, like, he killed him when he was, like, translating that uh, passage so it came off like a suicide note. It's like, mm -hmm. this is a very well executed, uh, you know, murder to make it look like suicide. Do you have any guesses to where this is going yet, or are you still kind of in the dark along for the ride? I, st I still have absolutely no idea where it's going. Which is, it's cool, being along the ride for once. Enjoying Monster still? Yeah, it's good. I mean, I think the fact that it's kind of settled into a groove and some of some of the uh, same story ideas are kind of coming up is, is maybe like a small criticism against the show, I guess, but none of these episodes are poorly executed, so I think it's not a big deal at all, really. Mm -hmm. 
anyway, that's for that's it for this week. Uh, next week is, as we determined, Doter driven, Doter edited. It's a real Doter extravaganza next week. It's gonna be real shit, sir. I'm gonna fuck all of it up. I'll still do the anime fake out. Don't worry. I'll still have something to do here. Oh, thank God. Anyway, that's it for this week. Um, let's see. Uh, it is October now, so I have the Horror Kiwi podcast going for this month, and episodes of that will be out on Tuesday, so the first episode should be out yesterday as you're hearing this. Assuming that this is a Wednesday. I'll be having guests for that. Yesterday's episode, I had my co-host from last year, and we watched uh, Itchy the Killer and Kill List. Uh, next week, we're watching Tenebrae and Hellraiser, and I have a guest. I have a host from the podcast Art, I Swear, with me there, and then I will have Cat Doter at some point in one of the last two weeks talking about 1922 Nosferatu followed by Shadow of the Vampire. As well, our Let's Play of Yakuza 2 is still going. Um, we're on episode 52, 53 now, I think. Um, we're, all, we're nearing the end of that pretty quickly. And also, we have Extra Life coming up on October 29th. I believe we are starting at 11 a.m. Pacific Standard, Pacific Standard, Pacific Daylight Time, 11 a.m. Pacific Time, minus 8 GMT. Um, we'll be playing for video games. I think we're going to try and do a tabletop role-playing game for a couple hours. We'll be going for 24 hours for that to benefit the UC Davis Children's Hospital. And if you want to donate to that, that is extra-life.org slash participant slash game kiwi. Um, I'll put a link to it in the description. I'll probably make a, a bit.ly link that's a lot shorter. And I'll put that in there too. Um, if you donate early, you can help determine what AP eats for dinner. You get to pick some ingredients that he will get to go buy and put in his sandwich and eat. Live on stream, from social eating from Game Kiwi this year. I'm just gonna have normal food. Um, yeah, and I'm gonna eat stuff not on the stream at all. It'll be fun. Yeah, everybody's eating stuff that day. Hopefully, eating and vaping. Well, that's just AP doing that. You don't know if I vape. Do you vape? No, I don't vape. It's just it is, yeah, it's just AP doing that. But I think that's it for immediate stuff. So yeah, thanks for listening to that. This and all the other stuff, I guess too. Yeah. Next week is episodes 27 through 30, as we said earlier. So, I'm Mike. I'm Katota. This has been Anime Kiwi. Thanks for listening, and as always, keep it anime.